Today, we'll continue our analysis of the Space Marines and we'll take a look at the Space Marines organs 8, 10, 11, and 12 to see how close we can come with modern medicine. And yes, this video will include some clips from the Russian Badger's now legendary video about the 2011 game, Space Marine. It's the only game we allow Billy, our Astartes neophyte, to play as he continues his journey to becoming a full-fledged Spice Marine! Spice Marine! Spice Marine! He is certainly familiar with post-surgery bed rest, and this is how we approach indoctrination for our Gen Z recruits. Billy, who is now 16, has received eight of the 19 implants. 22 if he's lucky enough to become a Primaris Marine. And his abilities extend far beyond those of a normal human. By now, his life is a whirlwind of intense training, chemical treatments, and hypnotherapy to support the biological changes that have already been made. He is well acquainted with pain and looks forward to further augmentations with a smile, even though they involve some seriously invasive surgery. What else would you expect from a man whose career will involve fighting off chaos incursions by the boatload? Lots to look forward to. In our last round of surgical augmentations, we happen to skip over the omophagia. The eighth gene seed organ is the ophthalmoglia, which is by far the fucking weirdest. And that's where we'll begin today. Also known as the remembrancer, this organ allows space marines to learn by eating. There we go, ass. It's a beautiful word. Which is to say, they can consume any genetic material and gain its memories, experiences, or knowledge. Lore tells us it is situated in the spinal cord, but is actually part of the brain, and has such a complex job that even in the far future, it is prone to defectiveness, rendering it useless in some marines and causing others to be triggered by blood and flesh of the dead. You know, since it requires snacking on stuff like this and this, and even this. But since an unappetizing snack could yield vital intel in the midst of a battle campaign, I doubt our grim dark heroes would think twice. Abandon reason, no only war! The omophagia is instilled into the marine spinal cord between the thoracic vertebrae and the stomach wall. Thus, it becomes part of the central nervous system, connecting the stomach to the brain by way of four nerve bundles implanted next to the stomach wall. The highest portion of the stomach is the fundus, which stores the gas produced during digestion, not food, unless the stomach is very full. Its position ranges from the middle of the eighth thoracic vertebrae to the 11th thoracic disc, with an average location opposite the middle third of the 10th thoracic vertebrae. In order to position the nerve implants beside the main body of the stomach, the omophagia could be implanted slightly below this level. The T12 vertebra is a safe bet. A nerve graft implanted in the walls of the stomach could theoretically transmit sensory data from the stomach to the omophagia and up the spinal cord. But there are two main challenges that come to mind. Successful nerve grafts rely on previously established innervation pathways and system functions to determine their function. If I lose my hand in an accident and receive a transplant, even if that transplant happens years after the initial injury, the brain instinctively recognizes the piece of flesh at the end of my arm as another hand. It's a pretty cool hand. We've been working well together, we're good partners. Over time and with therapy, my nerves may begin to work again. The restored sense of touch appears to stem from the brain's ability to reorganize itself after an amputation, says a 2014 NBC article. But if the new organ is unknown to the organism, the reorganization of the brain has no blueprint to follow, and the nerve grafts will not know what function they are supposed to perform. This is complicated further when we consider the complexity of the information the nerves are intended to extract from the cells. In Warhammer 40k lore, tales of the Remembrancer may involve a marine eating flesh, brain, or drinking the blood of someone or something in order to acquire intel about a given scenario or their surroundings. We purge the world of the taint lurking among the stars. We Obviously, a very helpful skill in the midst of intense missions, but it presupposes that memory is stored inside our DNA. 
the common component between brain, blood, and the flesh. In the year 2022, this premise is still up for debate. And over on Quora, a retired scientist named Harry Keisel attempts to throw a wet blanket on our homophagic party, stating there are 80 billion neurons in the brain, and each neuron probably communicates with thousands of other neurons, if not more representing a staggering number of possible interconnection patterns. It is currently thought that it is these patterns that represent memory storage, but this is not known. One contemporary life extending hypothesis involves preserving these patterns and connections until we learn how to upload the human connectome, the system of neural pathways in a brain or nervous system considered collectively into a computer. The world's first nanoscale whole brain uh, preservation technique. Meet Robert McIntyre, an MIT graduate who founded Nectome and developed a process called vitrifixation, which is able to preserve the synapses of a brain such that they look like the highest grade connectomics quality brains that are generally studied in neuroscience. Preserve the human synapses along with, theoretically, the memories they have helped form. Hold up. What? Robert's vitrifixation comprises two processes fixation and vitrification. Fixation uses a chemical called glutaraldehyde to solidify synapses and prevent them from degrading. And vitrification, which involves a chemical called ethylene glycol, which puts the brain into a vitreous or glass-like state and prevents it from freezing. It is then stored at minus 122 degrees Celsius. This way it can be stored for hundreds of years, according to Nectone. And good thing, because as of right now, we don't know how to extract memories from a dead brain. Hell, we have difficulty accurately or even approximately, except very roughly, localizing which parts of the brain store information and which parts create actions, muscle movement, homeostatic activity. And even when we do figure out how to pull this off, given the stories in Warhammer lore, this whole process needs to occur at near instant speed, faster than even Neo in the Matrix. Who spent 10 hours absorbing memories, albeit his new memories weren't real memories, but purely skills, and they were uploaded from a computer, if you recall. Oh, okay, I see what you did there. Oh, and this technology needs to fit inside our body and must function without access to a full brain. Our Marines just need something containing the target's DNA, remember? Thankfully, there have been more and more indications that undermine the classic belief that memories live in the brain. In 1962, biologist James V. McConnell proposed that the engram of memory, hypothetical trace of memory, resided in RNA molecules and that these could transfer that memory from one animal to another. In his experiments, he claimed to pass on a learning process from one worm to another by feeding the latter ground up remains of the former. Okay. Those remains weren't ground up, they weren't even remains yet, but you get what I mean. Worm eat worm, worm grows smarter. An article from BBVA Open Mind tells us, although McConnell's experiments were discredited, other studies were published that appeared to show a transfer of memories from one rodent to another through injections of brain extracts. The same article references a study that shows RNA molecules to be involved in the formation of long-term memory. More recently, in May 2018, a study conducted by David Glantzman of the UCLA showed that the injection of an RNA extract from specimens of the sea slug Aplasia Californica, trained to respond to an electrical stimulus, is capable of transferring this learning to other untrained individuals. Glantzman also showed the mRNA of the first animal stimulates the neurons of the second animal isolated on a petri dish. It's as though we transferred the memory, says Glantzman. If memories were stored at synapses, there is no way our experiment would have worked. Another study conducted by the MIMO TV, Memories of Traumatic Stress and Violence, showed that individuals undergoing a negative response to traumatic stressors can actually pass this on to subsequent generations through DNA processes. They showed that exposure to violence during pregnancy influences genetic activity, which is carried into the grandchildren's generation. This grim example alludes to the possibility of a genetic memory and the ability of the human body to decode and translate that memory into behavioral patterns. If this ability is already present in humans to some extent, Surely we could selectively breed for it over the next 28,000 years. You know, eating pieces of random biological creatures and then trying to solve a problem only they would understand. 
too gruesome. When refined, I'm curious how the homophagia would filter out unwanted behaviors and memories. If it turns out that the memories of a creature is stored in their DNA, I could imagine the Marines having difficulty integrating the entire consciousness of a being into their own. But maybe that's why this organ is prone to failure. One can only imagine what undesirable memories a Marine might be exposed to after chewing on an orc. <laughs> Well, Billy, we've got you slated in for this operation tomorrow afternoon. We'll be implanting some extra nerves and stimulating the brain's reorganization function by feeding you different varieties of genetic material and then having you attempt to solve problems that should only be solvable by the thing you just ate. Should be fun. And after that, we tackle the oculobe. Sitting at the base of the Marine's brain, the oculobe pumps a melange of hormonal and genetic material into the nervous system, enabling their eyes to respond to optic therapies to be administered by the apothecaries. I just hope they use some more precise equipment. See, the oculobe does not itself improve a marine's eyesight, but it allows technicians to make adjustments to the growth patterns of the eye and the light receptive retinal cells, resulting in a far superior set of peepers than the average human. Thank the God Emperor. Did you know that it takes an average person from five to eight minutes to have their eyes start to adjust to darkness? Unacceptable. To a tech priest living in the 40K world, humans are genetic rejects, pathetically flawed. The oculo would be installed in the occipital lobe near the back of our skull, since that is the part of the brain that controls our vision. Once installed, apothecaries would direct the Marines through a series of exercises similar to what an orthoptist might do today. Five and six. Uh... About the same? Yeah, they're pretty much, can I see five one more time? This is like physical therapy for your eyes that helps to improve control of the eye muscles to help treat eye movement disorders and visual impairments related to the way the eye interacts with the brain. However, our existing therapies target the coordination of the eyes and won't improve the quality of the vision so directly. A procedure that would actually improve vision would need to address on how the eye focuses an image onto the retina, a light sensitive layer of tissue at the back of the eye that receives and organizes visual information. And how effectively the retina processes this information, since this is the structure that sends information to your brain through your optic nerve, enabling you to actually see. Many structures influence light before it reaches the retina. The cornea bends light. The pupil and iris control how much light is let in. The lens focuses light. Finally, when light hits the retina, what you do see is limited by the photoreceptor cells that live there. In 2022, we will make adjustments to these structures with a variety of techniques. Laser eye surgery permanently changes the shape of the cornea with a beam of ultraviolet light that vaporizes tissue. Lens implants are available that focus incoming light more effectively onto the retina. Permanent ones, such as intraocular lenses, replace the natural lenses, while implantable columnar lenses synergize with our natural biology to achieve the same function. There are even retinal prostheses, implantable electronic devices designed to stimulate sensation of vision in the eyes of individuals with significant retinal diseases, where the optic nerve and visual cortex are unaffected. So if we throw the whole kitchen sink at our Marines and perform a combination of these procedures to maximize visual acuity, will their brains be able to process more complex information? Well, Dr. Matthew Sharp, a laser surgeon in Seattle, tells us there are people, probably about 3% of the population, who are capable of 2010 vision. It is reported that World War II fighter pilot Ace and test pilot Chuck Yeager, who passed away in 2020 at the age of 97, had 28 vision. He could see enemy fighters coming from up to 50 miles away. If some of us can see so much better than others, it's likely our hardware, not the inherent processing power of our visual cortex that limits our ability to see. A BBC article tells us there is no intrinsic limit to the smallest or the farthest thing that we can see. This used to be all orange groves, far as the eye could see. Just think about the stars 
in the night sky. The article goes on to say, so long as an object of whatever size, distance, or brevity transfers a photon to a retinal cell, we can spy it. The hormones and genetic material administered by the oculobe would help the apothecaries target the aforementioned structures in the marine's eye to take advantage of this fact. We know that estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, thyroid hormone, and melatonin are the main hormones related to our eyes. And if they are out of whack, we can't see properly. For example, estrogen, the main sex hormone in women, can cause the cornea to become more elastic, changing the way light travels through the eye. It is possible that by fine-tuning the levels of all hormones related to the eyes, visual acuity could be improved. But with this approach, we must keep in mind that hormones regulate many more processes than just our eyes. What about my feelings? This may be where the genetic stimuli mentioned in the lore comes into play. I imagine a mix of stem cells cultured with guide cells from the target structure. For example, corneal or photoreceptor cells. We know that by placing stem cells in the right environment, scientists can coax them into developing into specific kinds of cells. In 2022, researchers are even exploring the use of stem cells to cure blindness, with one of the most promising approaches targeting a part of the eye called the retinal pigment epithelium, which is a fundamental component of the retina that plays essential roles in visual functions. By studying animals, we know where to aim and perhaps how to direct these stem cells. The large corneas and pupils of a cat, about 50% larger than those of a human, allow more light into the eyes, which helps them to see in the dark. Meanwhile, the mantis shrimp has 16 color photoreceptors, compared to the human's paltry three, allowing them to perceive UV visible and polarized light. Thankfully, the apothecaries will have thousands of years to devise the therapy sufficient to invite changes like these. But even today, with the proliferation of digital interventions and the advancements in stem cell research around the eyes, it is possible that an oculobe like like upgrade for us isn't far away, but it won't be cheap. For example, a new gene therapy called Lux Turner for blindness will cost $850,000, says Spark Therapeutics, the company that makes it. The thing is, I gotta check in in the savings, but all the money is in my savings, so I gotta switch it to my checking, but it's gonna take three business days. But hey, you can't put a price on protecting humanity. I don't think it's gonna go through. All right, Billy, let's have a look at those ears. You'll be spending plenty of time in space, in and out of the atmosphere, and trekking across the solar system as modern space flight advances. Plenty of opportunity to experience motion sickness, but <clears throat> as the emperor of mankind has said, they will be untouched by plague or disease. No sickness shall blight them. So for a space marine to truly be his best, he needs to be fully immune to pesky things like getting dizzy on a spacecraft en route on a mission. This panel from Ian Watson's Space Marine has the answer. For this reason, your normal human ears will be removed along with their inner workings and replaced by the Lyman's ear, also known as the Sentinel, thereby improving their hearing, eliminating motion sickness, and allowing Marines to consciously filter out and enhance sounds using only their mind. Let's tackle the easy part first. In the year 2022, a biotech company named 3D Biotherapeutics successfully transplanted a 3D printed ear. Doctors implanted the ear in a woman from Mexico as the ear was reconstructed using cells from the patient who was born with a misshapen ear. A New York Times article tells us, this is part of the first clinical trial of a successful medical application of this technology and marks an incredible advance in the field of tissue engineering. But while the Lyman's ear looks no different than a typical human ear, it is functionally very different and highly superior in many ways. Let's first tackle the hearing abilities. A cochlear implant is a hearing device that has an external receiver that is worn over the ear and an internal portion that is implanted by an otolaryngologist or an ENT. Unlike conventional hearing aids, an internal electrode array is threaded through the cochlea, bypassing damaged portions of the ear to deliver sounds directly to the hearing nerve, or the auditory nerve. Given the current capabilities of audio technology, the function of a cochlear implant could be expanded to allow for noise cancellation. 
the targeting of specific frequency ranges to be amplified or filtered out. Since it bypasses the workings of the inner ear, there is more space for technology. A cochlear implant with these functions could be combined with a biological scaffold for a 3D printed ear and then grafted onto the Space Marine. But as cool as this sounds, it won't solve the immunity to motion sickness part. Many of us are familiar with motion sickness, typically a dizziness or nausea brought about by a sense of imbalance or the feeling that one is moving when they actually aren't. According to integrated ear, nose and throat, it is a result of a miscalibration between our inner ear and our eyes among several other factors. Paul DeZio, a neuroscientist at Brandeis University explains further in an article from Live Science. In our inner ears, there are three fluid filled tubes called semicircular canals. Each one is aligned with a different axis of motion up and down, left and right, and side to side. And when you move your head, the fluid inside the tube kind of flows a little bit. Sensors inside the tubes determine when and how we are in motion. If this information does not correspond to the directional information acquired by our eyes, we feel dizzy. Proper spotting technique keeps the eyes fixed on the world to counteract the spinning of the body keep looking at the camera until I can't anymore, and then I find the camera again and finish the rest of my rotation. And although we cannot train the fluid inside semicircular canals to resist motion, we can train the brain to be more tolerant of the feeling. Say, Billy, do you enjoy spinning around on an office chair? Because we'll be adding a healthy dose of it to your training regimen, bro. By now, there have been substantial research efforts, first in animals and more recently in humans, toward the development of vestibular implants. An article in Current Opinion in Neurology tells us, humans have demonstrated surprising adaptation capabilities to the artificial vestibular signal, which is great news for Billy. The vestibular implant consists of motion sensors rigidly fixed to the patient's head and of electronic components, a processor and a stimulator that translate the received motion information into electrical signals transmitted to the brain via electrodes implanted in the vicinity of the vestibular nerve endings. These would be calibrated to accommodate motion sickening maneuvers in ways that our current system is not designed to do. Any engineers in the comment section? Another crucial implant for the Astartes Warriors is the Susan membrane, aka the hibernator, as shown in this incredible artwork by the first mage lord at deviantart.com. This organ is implanted above their brain and then eventually fuses with the whole brain. With the proper training, hypno and chemical therapies, this organ allows a marine to enter a state of suspended animation consciously or as an automatic reaction to extreme trauma, keeping the marine alive for years, even if he has suffered otherwise mortal wounds. Yes, that's right, suspended animation, like old Uncle Walt himself. Suspended in a large metal cryogenic cylinder was none other than Walt Disney. Except, Imagine that Disney was mortally wounded at the time of his passing in 1966, and that his cryo sleep started hundreds of years earlier. According to Space Marine lore, the longest recorded period spent in suspended animation was undertaken by brother Silas, heir of the Dark Angels, who was revived after 576 years. Hmm. You may be surprised to learn that doctors have put humans into and pulled them out of a state of suspended animation for the first time in a groundbreaking trial that aims to buy more time for surgeons to save seriously injured patients. A 2019 article in The Guardian outlines the process, which involves rapidly cooling the brain to less than 10 degrees Celsius by replacing the patient's blood with ice cold saline solution, typically by way of the aorta, the main artery that carries blood away from the heart to the body. The rapid cooling reduces brain activity and slows the patient's physiology enough to give surgeons extra time to operate. Incredible as this procedure is, we're talking about a time frame ranging from a couple of minutes to slightly longer than one hour. To contend with Space Marine lore, we'll need something a little longer. What do you mean by that? Medically induced comas are already in use for patients who have suffered major physiological traumas. For example, a gunshot wound to the head. A study in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that anesthesia is essentially a reversible coma. Doctors administer specific drugs until the patient's brain waves are similar to those of a person in a natural coma. Thus, they create a reduction in brain metabolism, so it needs less oxygen, to help reduce swelling and aid its recovery. So this begs the question, 
Is a medically induced coma basically equivalent to being put into suspended animation? Well, suspended animation goes a lot further by lowering people's body temperature to almost completely stop metabolism in the body and brain. A modern day space marine would have to have their armor fitted with an emergency mechanism to administer a mixture of anesthesia and cooled saline compounds when necessary. Whatever engineer ends up making the suits will have their work cut out for them. If only we could devise a way to heal by destroying enemies like the video game. That's right, these guys are so draconian they don't need to pick up health kits because the enemies are the health kits. But alas, that is a pipe dream. And if no allies are nearby to help our injured Marine, liquid electrolytes and nutrients from a separate compartment would need to be injected into their veins to keep them from starvation and dehydration in the days to come. If they are forced to activate this procedure on a mission or on the battlefield, they would be extremely vulnerable without anyone to monitor their vitals or protect their body. And unlike the hibernator, our modern variant won't be able to shut down all biological functions slowing, then stopping the heart along with all metabolic and nerve activity. In our time, cardiac arrest can be fatal if it lasts longer than eight minutes without CPR. Brain damage can happen after just five minutes. This is why paramedic EMS teams start cardiac arrest treatment immediately upon arrival before the patient even gets to the hospital. Even when animals hibernate, their hearts continue to beat, though slowing considerably along with their metabolism. The body temperature drops in some extreme cases to below the freezing point of water which is zero degrees Celsius. But in my research, I didn't see any mention about lowering the body temperature of the Marines, which means their Susan membrane is more like temporary death than hibernation or suspended animation, which makes me curious about the mechanism by which the suspended Marine is revived when the situation allows. Although nerves are no longer firing, the membrane must do something to keep brain activity going, as no brain activity means the Marine would die. So there must be more to the Susan membrane than meets the eye which wouldn't be surprising considering the advancements which have been achieved by this time. Over on Reddit, there has been talk of situations where a space marine could survive a decapitation, such as with Eidolon being decapitated and later recapitated by Fabius. But generally speaking, even space marines can survive a beheading. Such feats appear to be reserved for orcs and chaos champions of Nergel. In other words, abominations in the eyes of the Imperium. Yes, we love all races, as long as they don't have green skin. Eat bolt gun! And on that note, we conclude today's lesson. We'll return to this topic in a few weeks to continue with Billy's augmentation process. We've made great progress, but he's still got a hefty amount of surgery to look forward to. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and share it with someone you know. If not, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one.